Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Welcome back to another <laughs> wonderful Wednesday on the family room. That never gets old. Never gets old. That's the, it's the catchphrase. You've got, you know, I'm going to preach before I get out of here. I've got the wonderful Wednesday. I know I got to get the girls to film a new one. Um, Definitely. Tomorrow. I planned on doing it this week. But let us know where you're watching from. Uh, just a heads up, this one is pre-recorded. Uh, we're here Wednesday morning doing it because my oldest daughter is starting soccer tonight. All right. And I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be at the soccer field you where you should be. At the soccer field. But uh, with that, like I said, let us know where you're watching. We're discussing Sunday's sermon, The Mercy of God. Ooh. Uh, and real quick, the announcements we have Dining with Dignity. The next one is September 5th. Uh, the next Women's Fellowship is September 12th. This was the new one, or the uh, Thursday night one that they do I guess, with whatever, what is September 12th? Come on, they're kicking that back up, yep. Yeah. Very good. It's um, time for short groups, small groups again. Yes, I'm, I'm excited. And we have so many other groups starting up, too. Mm -hmm. That's nice to finally see that catching momentum. Uh, September 15th is the fall potluck. I'm definitely looking forward Woo! to that because I love to eat. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Uh, and also, this next one, um, don't forget the Fire Youth now meets on Sunday nights here at the church at 6 p.m. It's not live streamed or anything, so you can't be lazy and stay home if you're in town. Come here, send your kids. <laughs> Just get here. It was good. It was good. Um, they did this, sun this last Sunday, the 18th was the first time they kicked it off, and it was great. I'm, I'm proud of Duel. I'm, yes, I'm excited. I still believe, you know, 100% he's the right guy. Uh, I, I talked with him afterwards, and we got to chatting, and they, his girlfriend and whoever else that came in, they were, like, ready to go, and we've been sitting there for, like, 20 minutes. He got here at 3 <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was here, here for a while. Which and if you're watching this live or Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, don't forget Saturday is the men's group. The uh, yes, tacos, tacos and testimonies, and testimonies. is going to be from 5 to 7. I've had a guy contact me from Palatka and ask if he can bring two friends with him. I'm like, come on. Yeah, fine. bring, bring you them. You hear tacos and everybody's like, let's go. Yeah, you get food involved, people will show up <laughs> immediately. <gonna> good. <laughs> three guest fine. speakers. we got three short testimonies. It's going to be a great night. Don't miss it. Yeah, and I, I had... Um, I don't remember his name. They're a new family. They just started coming recently, and, and he wanted to come. So he had asked about the information. Cool. Um, also on September 15th is the Fire Youth Ultimate Frisbee Woo. Uh, game. So that Kelsey and I were talking about that earlier. We really enjoy playing that. Ultimate Frisbee? Yep. I she and I get together all the time out Ultimate there in y'all's field, is. and we play. And I can't wait for the young people to experience it. I don't know if any of them have ever heard of it, but it's going to be good. It's like Frisbee, but Ultimate. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. I can barely throw a frisbee. I don't know what it is either. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a, a baseball and we'll throw that or a football. <laughs> so I, can't, I can't throw a frisbee that well. Uh, the next new visitors, new members class, I don't know. We still haven't. <laughs> we always. Visitors, new visitors class. If you're new to the church and you want to find out more information and all that kind of stuff, that's on September 22nd. We usually do that immediately following church. Uh, and it's less than 30 minutes. We have uh, just we a real quick them. video and a short little thing that we go through just to give you information. We do food. And all that. Yeah, usually, I think all. we usually, I think so. And then... Uh, I think so, they just stick around for the food. I'm all about the food. Because especially <laughs> Sundays, I don't, I don't eat. I, f I always fast on Sunday morning. So by the time, by the time I'm preaching, I'm already... I'm hungry. You know, I'm, I'm angry. I'm Everybody's like, why do you talk about Texas Roadhouse? Because I am hungry. Already. <laughs> <laughs> I am starving. Um, and September 27th, the last thing uh, will be we're having a bring a board family night. Woo. All of these things are on the website, familychurch.social slash events. Uh, bring a board family night. If I am correct, it will be, what am I doing on my phone? There we go. Uh, it will be bring your own boards like a charcuterie uh, board. Yeah, I was going to butcher that name. That's so why bad, I so jumped in. I can see the blank board, expression. A dessert board. <laughs> 
chartreuse board, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, all those kinds of we things. We will provide and, highlights before then. <laughs> and board games. Uh, so it is an, an event that you will not be bored at because there will be many boards to, uh, to eat and play. So our kids, Kelsey and, 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 the, and the, well, Kelsey didn't really do it that much, but the kids love, I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's sitting over here so I get to say stuff. <laughs> um, Scowling at us. They love the board games, so it's, it's always a fun, um, they love like Jumanji mm-hmm. and they have Dogopoly and then I forget the other ones. We have Uno and Uno Attack. September is going to be a fun. really cool month for community, getting together, get small groups are building back up. Everything's going on again. It's that I time it of the year. starts cooling down. Start cooling down. That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Start cooling I'm down. Dying. And uh, the softball stuff, the softball date, if you're in that group, that will all get announced soon. Coming up. Uh, but, yeah, Sunday was, what was it, Lamentations 3? Lamentations 3, 22 through 24. The mercy. The steadfast God. love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Uh, the idea that I was trying to convey um, is the mercy of God as it's displayed to us and through us. It was a great day. It was difficult. It's those kinds of topics, and you're going to run into them in your tenure. They are, they are difficult. They challenge because people sitting in the seats know Mm-hmm. Um, whether they are merciful or not. And so when you start talking about mercy, they instantly start getting a little bit tense. But you have to find a way to communicate that to them in a way that, you know, you see the hope in it and the reason yeah. for it and how God's it's, given it. Yeah, it's, it's, I think I felt that way on the, the broken vessels. There was one, one sermon I did somewhat recently that I had that where it was just one of those where you just feel like, yeah. you know, it's it's missing, but it ends up everybody needed yeah. it, and you come down, and you're like, that was awful. But it was just yeah. the, I guess it was just the heaviness, the weight coming off is probably yeah. the way and to look it's, at it. It's like surgery. It's going yeah. straight to the heart. It's dealing with the heart issues. And I think churches and preachers need to be strong enough in doing that because those are the issues that matter the most to people. You can preach surface issues all day long and get the people to shout and chest bump and high five, but when you get down deep into the 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 matters of the heart, it really changes. I, was, I think I told you that the young lady who came up to me afterwards uh, talked to me about mm-hmm. her daughter uh, just in tears and talking about how she appreciated the revelation of mercy, how it was important, how important it is to be merciful. So I did see you threw in uh, the thing I had said to yes. you before your office. He desires mercy and not sacrifice. He desires sacrifice. mercy, not sacrifice. Yes, he certainly does. Uh, yeah, our God. That's something uh, we, we need to get back to. The people that they see God often, too often through the lens of judgment um, and conviction and condemnation and all of that, when the exact opposite is actually the truth, uh, that he is a God who is rich in mercy. His mercies never fail. Uh, his mercy is extended to us ad infinitum. It just, it never comes to an end. And when you understand that, it changes how you live, how you treat others, how you receive mercy and give it. Um, it was built on the premise that I that I I shared with everybody and transparently is that, uh, and unfortunately you grew up with it. But I, I lived a lot of my life as a very unmerciful person, very black and white. Uh, no. Here's the rule. This is the rule. <laughs> obey the rule. You don't obey the rule. You pay the price. And you know it's just a very harsh way to live. And then one day I was reading through the, the book of James, chapter two and verse thirteen, and I saw that what James said, you will have judgment without mercy if you show no mercy. And for the first time, I think, in my life, I got it. I was like, oh, no. That's Yeah, it's definitely, like you said, something that needs to get preached more because, and I'm sure, and I don't know how Eastern culture is, but like like you said earlier, like surface level stuff, American churches are completely just, just... Barely. I'm well like that. You can what they say you can drown in a spoonful of water, Come and that's on. basically what we're doing. We're drowning in just the surface level instead right. of plunging deep into the well. And it, it's I, I don't know if that was a spark, but it's 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 a good segue to that. The post that you put on yesterday about the culture that you want to create. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's it's family room night. Let's dig in on that for a second because that was kind of attached to that. That you can stay in those surface issues all day long, and you can get a shout up, and you can turn everybody's emotions all up. But you want to create a culture. Yeah, I mean, you think like. I just thought about this. Like Jesus, he comes down and he says, you know, I didn't, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. He came 
to establish and in, inaugurate the kingdom of heaven. He came to to create mm-hmm. that culture. I mean, yeah, in the Old Testament, you know, God laid out all of the law and laid this out, and then you know, it, it turns into the law just ends up. It shows us how short we fall and the standards are just too high we can't reach it it show it points towards we need jesus we need jesus to live the only perfect life to come down you know and live the righteous life to set us free from everything from from sin and shame from from death and hell and oh man i just lost where i was going what, what was it the culture that you the want cult, to create yeah, there we go so he came down that. and he and he establishes that and I hear it all the time with, oh, you know, I'll, I'll say, you, you know, a, a vision for the church, or I want to do, I want to do this, I want to try that, and you get met with the resistance of, oh, that will never work here, that won't happen, that's not going to do, you long know, what sermons. you think it's going to do, yeah, the, your sermons are too long, this and that, and it's like Jesus, you know, he preached for for three days, mm-hmm. and he preached for. Num- like numerous occasions, the people just kept flooding in and and desiring that because they were hungry. And it's the problem with American Christianity, which I almost even hesitate to call it that. I mean, it's just it's so surface level. It's just we're not even like Christians anymore. We're just going through. Yeah, Christian. It's just Ish. it's like a little hit, a mishmash of things, and we keep seeing what we can Ooh. compromise and how we can peel off the layers and stay up here. That way, you know, we don't offend anybody. We don't want to say anything. So we're how close can canceled. we stay to the world? Yeah, and it's like, and and I get on one aspect of that. Like I think I've said it before, mm-hmm. and you've said it of staying so close to the gates mm-hmm. of hell that you can stop the people from coming in, right. but you shouldn't be so close that they can't even tell you're trying to stop them from getting in, and you're already starting to get burned because you've leaned so far that way. So there is that that fine yeah. line, but it's just that like. I desire, I, I, well, okay, so let me dial it back. So like when I got the call and I said I refuse to tell God no, that's kind of the same approach that I take with the vision I have for the church and where I want to see, and not. And I, when I say the church, I don't even mean just here, just the church, mm-hmm. like you and I, we are the church, Kelsey's the, Christians, we are the church, mm-hmm. we're the body of Christ. That That is my vision. You have to, and obviously with here, is just creating that culture. You have to refuse to back down. You have to refuse to settle for surface level. You have to refuse to settle for, oh, that's not going to work here. I mean, you think of any, and people throw up their their haunches or whatever and get all upset if you hackles. talk about hackles. That was the word I was looking for. They, they get all their hackles in a bunch. I don't even know. That doesn't sound, <laughs> that is not my language. But it's like when it comes to church, you know, we're like, oh, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. The church has to be this way. But then you step out into the world and you take a company like Apple or Google Mm -hmm. or Samsung, whoever, who, a Coca-Cola, any company. And it's like, where did they start? What did they refuse to stop at? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Apple, Google, I don't even, I think Amazon, whoever, they started in a garage. Mm -hmm. How many people do you think were like, this isn't going to work? There's no way you're going to get this thing off the ground. This is not, you're in your garage. Mm -hmm. There's no way you're going to have cell phones and computers that Mm -hmm. most of the world is going to have. And now look at it. A trillion dollar company. Exactly. So it's like the same thing with the church. You have to, you have to keep that, that vision in mind of what Jesus established. And then you're like, okay, well, you know, we all have different flavors or whatever, you know, in the, in the denominations, you know, some people don't like the t-shirt thing. They want you to come up and like, okay, that's like splitting hairs. And we argue about it Straining as if it's just, cameras. yeah. And it's, it's stupid. There's no sense in arguing over that stuff, but it's like you, you create that culture that you want. Mm-hmm. I want to create the culture of this church, family church in general, that just is on fire for God, that is hungry for God, that wants to come in at 9.30 so they can get a seat instead of coming in at 10.30 trying to skip the worship. Uh, A a culture that's not afraid to break loose and dance and clap and shout instead of just standing there white-knuckled on the back of the seat because you're too afraid to get, you know, to lift your hands to God. But as soon as you go to a a Zach Brown or Zach Bryan concert and you're three beers deep, all of a sudden you can scream every single lyric to Morgan Wallen or whatever. Whatever, you know, but it's like we put all of our, all of our time and our energy into the wrong things, and and we live unfortunately. <laughs> See, y'all know how to get me started. We live unfortunately. <laughs> all I do is pull the string, yeah, and then <laughs> well, it's <laughs> and let him go. <laughs> we don't have. 
I don't remember if you said it recently or where I heard it, but it's just the the reality, the unfortunate reality is, to make a long story short <laughs> about creating the culture, we're not in the mindset enough of eternity. We don't have eternity in our minds enough to truly be pressing in. And we need, as not just family church, but as Christians in the body of Christ in general, we, we seriously need to get back Amen. to having that mindset of eternity First and well, you know, Urgency. first and foremost, just seek first the kingdom of God, realizing that all of this mm -hmm. in this life is practice for what comes next. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter about storing your treasure here; all of that's going to get I'm literally burnt away. The earth is it, God's going to just coming. wipe everything out, and we're going to have the new the new heaven or whatever new Jerusalem. And then you know, if you make the choice not to follow him, you know where you're going. And that's just the, uh, you know, that's just the reality of it. And it's, we need to not be afraid anymore Amen. of creating that culture and, and not to keep going, but it just reminded me the thing you said a minute ago about people viewing God as not merciful and, you know, iron fist kind of thing. I've heard it. It always stuck with me. And, um, that a lot of people's viewpoint of God comes from how they view their father. Mm -hmm. Because obviously God is the father. So if you had a father figure that wasn't merciful or was neglectful or not even there, those are already those roadblocks for you to find the, the true, the true, the truest I don't know the word I'm looking for, but just the, the true reality of who God is, the type of father that he is. And he is merciful. I mean, right here, verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. Mm -hmm. He establishes his commandments. And then all throughout the Old Testament, everybody always wants to point at, oh, God was wiping out the opposing nations. And then he was wiping these people out and wiping this out. And it's like, you don't understand how horrible the world was at that right. time. I mean, they're sacrificing, and they're still doing it. You know, I don't want to get kicked off the internet, but sacrificing kids and, you know, just the satanic orgies and all the, it was, the world was a terrible place. And, and what's funny is we look at, oh, God wiped all that out. But then you look at when the Israelites went to go attack those or fight those people or whatever, you know, take their, take the promised land. God tells them, Hey, first come towards them and, and let them know, like they can come in and be grafted into you. But if not, then do that. It's the same thing with, it's with mercy. It, it's, it's continued out in, in Christianity until the end of time, like approach them with mercy, approach them with love, tell them the truth. Like God is real. You need to be serving him. Like this is the true way to live. If you reject it, well, you know, that doesn't work out too good in the end. Do you even need me for this conversation? I do now, because I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know what you guys are thinking. Push the like button and share and pass it on. Let somebody know where you're watching from. <laughs> A quote from Sunday that came up. Anything that he just stirred up, <laughs> be glad to throw that in there. <laughs> no, I, I just, that's what the family room is for. People need to hear your heart. I, I really, I'm convinced of that. One of the, the, the benefits of this little format right here is that you can't say stuff predominantly like that on Sunday, where you just freewheel it and talk it and share it. And so in here, people get to hear your heart. They get to hear, because I think that one of the reasons people get nervous about, you know, the vision and where we are and where we're going is because they might not know exactly your heart. I think sometimes that's important because they think, well, y'all are just buying land and trying to build a big building because you just want to have a big, no, that's not it at all. What that is, is that we're trying to reach as many people as possible for the kingdom as fast as possible to get that done before it's eternally too late. And I think it's important for them to hear that. I, what amazes me is how is that not the predominant mindset of every Christian? Oh, you just hit American Christianity. We're, That's we're what about I'm comfort, like, convenience and routine. Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 15, mm -hmm. the Great Commission. Go out into the world. Mm -hmm and make disciples Pretty of clear. everyone, of every nation. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. But as soon as you're like, hey, we're bigging a bu building a bigger building, oh, you're just trying to get more money. No, I'm trying to stop people from going to hell for eternity. Create a place to worship. Like, we, we get so upset, you know, oh, your sermon is an hour long, an hour and 20, an hour 30. Well, for some cultures, that's the warm-up, that's the intro. Yeah. The other side of it is, what's an hour of 
one day out of your week or two hours. It's 160 one day out of your week. week. If we take two of those, so you've still got 166 hours Even if for the church remainder. Was eight hours, right? And there's still 160 hours in your week. What is that compared to eternity? Like I've, we just, we don't, that, it doesn't click. That mm -hmm. That's it. It doesn't well, end. And that's why people get antsy about it. They start to reject that because that's their, that's their model. That's the model that they have. Uh, and when you challenge that, then it literally shakes them because they... And then they start coming up with all the reasons why you shouldn't do that. But the, you're, you're right. It's, there's an urgency that should be prevailed by us that should be reaching people as fast as possible. And an hour-long instruction. Man, I sat in college classroom for four hours at a time listening to a professor drone we, on about nothing. We don't care about time you, until oh. it comes to church. Then all of a sudden, nothing. I got stuff to do. Y'all need to wrap it up. I need to get to the boat. game. Yeah, all of that. Yeah, don't get me started. Go watch the Avengers for three hours. Yeah. Zack Snyder for three, four hours. You know, it's, we don't care <clears throat> when it's entertainment or something we want to do, mm -hmm. which ties back into that's why we need our hunger back for God because yeah. we're clearly not hungry enough if we're not wanting to spend that much time. And then that's why jumping back, you know, whatever week it was where I was like, the altar call was I, I didn't want to lead a prayer because I, there's so many times where it's like people think all the power of prayer is, is from someone else. Right. The pastor should do it or the altar worker should do it. And it's like, what are you doing when you're not in this room? We've tried to eliminate that. I started that years ago when I started seeing people were too hyper-focused on, on me as the yeah. guy. I, I need him to lay hands on me and pray for me. I need him to speak a word over me. I started to back away from that, and I moved from being the quarterback to being the coach. And so far, it's worked out very well. So, I mean, that's not – and we see it. And there's that fine line. We were talking about it the other day, that, that fine line with, with churches where it's like, okay, you know – you, you pick a church that you like. You like the worship. You, you like the pastor, how the pastor preaches, what he preaches. But then there's that other side where the pastor needs to take a sabbatical or take a vacation to replenish himself and refuel himself. And all of a sudden, everybody stops going. Hmm. And essentially, what that screams is they've made an idol Ooh. out of that pastor. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I get it. You want to hear that person, mm -hmm. but... That person is not the end-all, be-all. They're still just a vessel for God's voice. And, and, and you can hear something from a guest speaker just as well as the pastor of that church. But don't you think that also that most of the people that go there, that it's not, I get it, but you're, the other side of that is that that's your shepherd. Yeah. And I know my shepherd's voice and I like that's to hear it. It's like that, it's that fine yeah. line. Like you should still keep coming. And nowadays, you know, like, yeah, we can, we'll, you know, record a sermon or yeah. whatever so they can still hear the shepherd, but I think some people just, they go too far and it's like, if, if it's not them, I'm turning it off. I'm, I'm not going until he's back. And it's yeah. like, that's, that's wrong. That's, that's a little too far. You gotta, yeah. I've seen it too. Out. Like when it was announced that a guest speaker was coming, that they just, the poof buildings check empty. out. That's embarrassing. Uh, Cause then you just the shepherd look at and go, man, y'all didn't support this. Yeah. So mercy, mercy. Now We're, we jump back into there. Have mercy. Minutes of back to mouth. the sermon of mercy. So, but for me, it was, it, it, and I figured, you know, this would take us tonight five minutes because it's truly such a simple subject. Uh, God has given us mercy and we must receive that mercy and then we must give that mercy. And if you don't, you set in motion a cycle where you will not be in a position to receive because based on God's law of reciprocity, whatever a man sows, he will always reap it. So when you sow mercy, you will reap mercy. And uh, the way, uh, transparently, the way I live my life, even now, still requires that I will constantly be needing mercy. Uh, I said it Sunday, and you know, I, I love this, this house. I'm saved, but I've still got a temper. Somebody contacted me later that afternoon that when they watched the replays, and they wrote back and said, thank God I thought I was the only one who was, was a Christian who still had a bad temper. <laughs> Good Lord, no. Half the people in this building and <laughs> half the people out there have more than that. I'm saved, but I still got a tongue that can get me in trouble. So That's the whole point of crucifying the flesh. I, I don't know. It's like people think you just do it once and then it's done. You know, oh, Jesus coming to my heart and then it makes you perfect. No. Yeah. <laughs> You're perfect in his sight, but you've still got just be, oh, how did it get said? I mean, it, I don't remember how the, the exact phrasing, but it was like just because you've got... Jesus now that doesn't break your old habits. Mm -hmm. You still have to 
actively be picking up your cross, mm -hmm. denying yourself, dying Daily. to your flesh, crucifying your flesh every day. And that's, that's a struggle. And like, like that with mercy, yeah, it's a simple subject. In, in theory. Verbalization. <laughs> in practice... Because I mean, just it, let's just get let's get real. I mean, mercy. We want mercy. Mm -hmm. We don't want to give mercy. It's a fact. We will mm -hmm. fly down the highway at seventy miles an hour in a forty-five, and you see a cop's got someone else pulled over, and you're like, "Yeah, ha ha! I hope you get them and all that stuff." You don't want you to get pulled over. Nope. You want the cop to be pulling somebody else over, but you don't want the cop to pull you over. You don't want the ticket. You know, you you do something wrong. But then you look at Mercy. someone stealing something from a store. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hope they, you know, oh, I hope you'll get what's coming to And it's like, mm -hmm. what are you doing behind the scenes that you still need mercy Woo. about? But you want all the mercy for you, but not for the, uh, the others. There's a lot, to, yeah, it's a lot to unpack. It's a lot. It sounds great. Yeah, just show mercy. But then you step back and you're like, I like getting mercy. Well, I, I like I, giving. We've got people, we've got a member of this congregation that uh, has told me, many years ago that uh, experiences that she had um, where she was brutalized and abused and, and raped and beaten and left for dead and for years she struggled with that you know because she would come in here and you'd hear the, a sermon like that on mercy and she was just boiling and still boiling inside about how this person had done all this um, and then one day lo and behold this true story this actually happened the person showed up for church here at the same time she was here Mm. And she said it was at that service that God really did a work in her heart. As she That's why them. they were there. <laughs> For the first time in her life, she saw that person as the pathetic mess that they, that they were and that they were a person who they really needed salvation or they were going to spend eternity in hell. And it, it changed her. So I, I think about things like that when I preach. Uh, I remember those kinds of stories, and I try to make that relatable to everybody in the building because when you throw it out as a blanket statement and saying, you just need to give everybody mercy, you got to remember, you got people sitting out there that have had some hellacious experiences. Oh, like that. Exactly. No, that's like that. terrible. A, a mother that years ago over on Kings Estate Road, her 18-year-old daughter was raped and murdered and stuffed into a trunk in Jacksonville and, you know... The guy left her there like a piece of trash. And one day I was over on Kings of State Road and I was preaching on loving the sinner. Woo. And she came to me after service and she was mad. And I get it. So you have to remember that, that in theory, you're right, but in practical experience, it's, it's a challenge. But I love what you said about Jesus, you know, at the, when he was on the cross and the last thing he said, Father, forgive them. They, they don't even know what they're doing. No. That can be the part of the root of mercy that can help set you free is that when they're being unmerciful, hopefully... They don't realize what they're doing. No. My, and something I heard recently, and I talked to you about it, about the whole, just the realities of warfare and the spiritual warfare, and that if they, don't, if they don't belong to God, if they don't belong to Jesus, if they don't have the Holy Spirit in them, by default, they're still following Satan. So they're still under his control. They're under his dominion. That doesn't mean, you know, that I'm not trying to say like, uh, every atheist or every non-believer is slam-packed full of demons. I mean, mm -hmm. they could, but yeah. they, you know, they could have had just some demon come in and influence them, and that set them off on on that path. And until they get brought into the kingdom, they're not going to know what they're doing. And the 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 greatest thing and, and a big eye opener for me, and, and hopefully for the people watching, is just. They're prisoners of warfare. They're, they're prisoners of warfare. They're like, they're literally POWs. They're like captives, held captive by the enemy, held prisoner by the enemy. And, you know, we look at people, like the pastor said, you drive down the street and you see people tweaking out on drugs. And it's like, it, it's not really the drugs, it's they're full of demons. And like, yeah, obviously the drugs is a part of it, but when you boil it down, we're all, we're all eternal. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, what do they say? We're, we are a soul with the body. The body dies, the soul lives on. So it's, they still have their soul. The body might be on drugs, but the soul's being tormented by the enemy. The soul is a captive mm -hmm. by the enemy. The soul is a captive of warfare. And that's just, when you can switch your thinking to that and realize 
you know, I've got to be doing something. Jesus came and saved me and he gave me the equipment necessary to go out and help fight this war and help bring people back from, you know, being in chains, bring people back from being uh, addicted and in bondage and, and in depression and bring people back from being a prisoner of warfare. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just the, the greatest way to look at it. And then, mm-hmm. you know, the, the other side of, and and not to make light of it, but it's like, the whole thing, like, you know, mercy, yeah, it's good talking about it. And, and in practice, it's hard. And it is hard like that. You get, you get, your kid gets killed, you get raped, you get, you know, violated. And obviously that's, that's a hard thing to come across. It doesn't mean, you know, you need to invite the person into your house, but the forgiveness of them and moving on from that sets you is free. what sets you free. Right. And the reality is, like that, they don't know what they're doing. They're just full of evil. You, you've got Jesus in you. He loves you just as much as he loves them. I mean, a lot of people don't want to step into that kind of stuff. They don't want to realize that God loves you and I and you watching just as much as he loves Hitler. And he didn't stop loving Hitler when Hitler died. All the people in hell, nothing. the Bible says nothing separates you from the love of God. So just because your body is dead and your soul is in eternal torment, mm-hmm. he still loves you. And I can't, wow. that's got to be such a grieving thing for God because it's like he still loves them. And he wishes that they w- we would all be in heaven with him because that was the original intention. He's not willing that any but, should perish. Yeah. yeah, that's why I said it's the, the, truly the revelation of mercy is one of the greatest revelations that you will ever step into in your entire life. Because once you understand it, it becomes the basis for that. Um, I, that's why I said it's one of the hidden keys of evangelism. Because you truly can't evangelize people until you have the mercy that Jesus had. When you look at them as shepherds scattered abroad, Matthew chapter 9, like sheep having no shepherd, he was moved with compassion for them and his compassion exploded into action. So if you have his compassion, mercy, on you and in you as you see them tweaking and you see them sinning and violating and all that kind of stuff, there's a mercy that in you that reaches out to them because you realize they're lost and they need a savior. And they need a shepherd. And and that's why I got on the tangent about it for a few minutes about preaching. The preachers. A preacher, it's a dangerous thing. Uh, I said it can either bless you or it can mess you up. Um, whatever the words of the preacher say. I, and, and so I just said, let the message be mercy. And a lot of people requoted that. Let's normalize mercy. Let's make mercy the message. And when you make mercy the message, we're so used to preachers preaching Judgment. Mm-hmm. And get right. That's what I was thinking about. The, you're gonna be in hell. And, and but if you preach the mercy of God, you'd see the cross. You'd see God sending His Son. You would see the sacrifice paid for you. Then you can have more. Uh, you'll have more success because mercy is much better than strict justice. Yeah, I mean, I've always, I've heard it. You know, I've heard it. I've heard it said. Um, you know, you can't you can't argue someone into heaven. Right. I mean, you look at, like I've talked about here, the, that street preacher that has, uh, he's got the mercy and compassion down, down pat. I mean, they're coming up, screaming at him, cussing him out, and he doesn't ever, it, nothing, like he doesn't get anything. He's just full of love and, and preaching love. He's not out there, you know, a lot of people that, like you said, they, they preach that judgment. Oh, you're, you're in sin. You're gay, so you're going to hell. Like, what, who are you to say that? You're, that's not your job. Your right. job is to tell them the truth. Like, hey, mm-hmm. this lifestyle can lead you to hell, but Jesus loves you and he wants you to turn from it. That's the challenge. That's a good challenge because when, when you talk about that, compassion does not mean compromise. Those are two totally different well, people things. Think, people think love means tolerance. Mm-hmm. And we forget Jesus loves everybody. Love means truth. But he doesn't tolerate their right. sin. So I can lo- like that. And, and I just saw, I actually just saw one of his reels yesterday. And they were sitting out there and um, actually it was a different, a different one. But they came up and they're cussing him out. Oh, you hate me. And he's like, no. They're like, yes, you do. All you people hate me. He's like, no. They're like, oh, you love me? He's like, yeah. No, you don't. You hate me. It's like, what? You, what? No, that's just you. He <laughs> built that perception. You, up yeah, you built head. that perception probably because for a lot of the case, you think, and just like a general statement, you know, a lot of people, they might have grown up or had some interaction with church, and that was their interaction yeah. was the Ooh. judgmental pastor, the pastor that, oh, you, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're all going to hell. And meanwhile, he goes home and gets drunk every night and then beats his wife, but nobody knows right. about it. And, that and it's like... You know, that's not, I heard, actually, I think 
Stephen Furtick just recently said it. He's like, I'm so tired of hearing about church hurt. Because it's not, it's not church hurt. It's people hurt. People are the ones that hurt people. But, you know, and you hear it said like, oh, you go to one restaurant and you get a bad meal. You get a, something bad happens. You don't stop going to every single other restaurant. You don't quit eating. You might stop going to that one. Or you might try it again and get something else. But you don't quit eating. Right. You just change where you're going. And that's how it should be for churches. I mean, clearly, not every church should have its doors open. We got to do the better. That's, and, and that's the kind of culture that we want to create here. And I knew when I said that Sunday that it was going to be a, a thing because uh, I told the story about the girl that showed up at the pantry with a gay pride shirt on. And nobody was judging her, nobody at all. And she was, you know, crossing her arms trying to hide it, you know, so nobody would see it while she was there to pick up her stuff. And I just felt it, man. I just, you know, loved her and went over and gave her water and talked to her and chatted with her a bit. I want us to, in this house, and it's not pandering to any particular crowd, but to remember and realize that compassion and compromise are two different things. You're not compromising the gospel by being compassionate. And we need to welcome, and I hope, I know it will continue in, under your administration, to welcome saint and sinner with the same enthusiasm. Because there is, but for the grace of God, there's very little difference between the two. Yeah. If any, other than salvation. And some people are borderline on that. Welcoming saint and sinner with the same enthusiasm. You know, we're glad you're here. We're not going to judge you, condemn you, criticize you. We're not going to condone your sinful behavior. Don't expect me to, to create and craft a message that will dance around whatever it is that you need to hear. We're going to tell you the truth. We, we've had lesbian That's couples that have come here. I mean, we've had lesbian don't. couples that have come here, and they know my stance on all of that, but they will say, you know, we appreciate you being truthful without being hateful, and there's a total difference. Yeah, and eventually, I mean, that's, that's planting seeds, and whether that, you know, grows fruit is something in their life, but you being uh, true to the calling and, and true to God's word, that's something he honors, and, and that's, that's the whole point. I think people, <laughs> it's like we want to plant the seed and then we want to water it, and then we want to make it grow. And it's like, no, your job is just to go out and, and plant the seed, and God handles the rest. Your job is to help catch the fish. His job is to clean them up <laughs> or, like I said, sort them out at the end if they don't want to get cleaned. And, and the compromise, the compassion and the compromise. I, I heard something. I've been listening to so much. I don't remember if it was today or yesterday, but there, there was something... And it must have been, I was doing something, you know, you're listening and you're doing something else. But they had said something, there's the two different kinds of compromise mm. in, in, like, uh, in faith. There's like a healthy compromise, which is um, like that. Like, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'll sit down. You know, I'll, I'll love you because you're a person. We can talk. And I'll hear where you're coming from. But that's it. I'm still keeping my stance. Instead of, that's you compromising, like, I'm not going to be anything with I that person. Do with I don't want anything to do with them. I'm not going to talk to them. They're sinners. Mm -hmm. They're a lesbian couple. We don't do that. We don't believe in that. We don't agree with that. That's being rigid. That's not going to lead anybody there. But if you have the, it's weird to say, but like the healthy compromise of, okay, I'm going to sit down and treat them as a person, like Jesus mm -hmm. would, having dinner with them, sitting Absolutely. down with the sinners and the tax collectors. He did it. But then, obviously, there's the unhealthy compromise where, oh, you know, God loves you. He, he, he made you gay. No, that's not a thing. And you weren't born that way either. Uh, that sounded so hateful after all that. But, it, I mean, that's the reality of it. Um, let me bring that back. <laughs> the, the unhealthy compromise of, you know, watering down the gospel mm -hmm. and saying that everyone is accepted no matter once, mm -hmm. no matter what. And, you know, once you have Jesus in your heart, you know, it doesn't matter what you do after right. that. You don't have to live uh, a life striving to be good. You don't, you don't have to try to stop sinning. You know, you can keep looking at right. pornography. You can keep doing all those Straight drugs. You can keep sleeping around. That's the unhealthy compromise. Mm -hmm. That's the compromise you don't want. It's not but, compromising in a healthy way of laying down your pride, setting anger aside, and looking at people as if they are people instead of, yes. instead of if, as if they're a project mm -hmm. that you have to save them. And just treating them with the love mm -hmm. and compassion and mercy of Jesus, that's what leads people to Jesus Amen. because they see, oh, okay, you know, I know he doesn't agree with my lifestyle, but he still treats me like a person, yes. and he still loves me, and he's not beating me over the head with judgment. He's just telling me about Jesus, and he's showing me Jesus. Well, now I want to see 
Who is Jesus? If they've never seen anything Why about Jesus, yeah. and I want to look up, you know, what, what, what? Maybe there is something to what this person is doing and how they're living. You know, they're walking through hell. They've lost their family. They've lost their husband. They've lost kids. They've lost their home. But somehow they're still happy and they still have peace. There's got to be something to that. That's mm -hmm. that's that healthy compromise. Is treating people as people and not a project. I want to normalize that, and for the people in our house and those who come to church here and watch us online. Um, normalize mercy. Let us normalize mercy in a mean world. That people get enough meanness everywhere they go. And in the house of God, when they come to church, there, there needs to be a different atmosphere. That welcoming, loving, we, you know, all that we can do to point you to the Father. And I said, if the preachers will preach the, the message of mercy, we will watch the prodigal sons and daughters run back to the arms of the Father because that. There, there's something in that that resonates in the heart of every person who just really wants to be loved and wants to hear the truth. So, I mean, and that's exactly what happened to the prodigal son when he was coming back. He, he thought his dad was going to be mad yeah. and he wouldn't be able to get accepted back into the family. But, you know, like the Bible says, as he was still a long ways off, the father saw him and the father ran to him, mm -hmm. which would have been humiliating at the time for that culture. So it's just the testament of God's love is as soon as you start coming towards him, he is running at you Amen. to accept you. And, Thank God for it. And you think too, like, like that, normalizing compassion and mercy. Jesus literally said, you know, when you, when you feed the hungry and you clothe the naked and you help out the least of these, that's as if you're doing it to right. him. So... On the flip side of that, if you do the opposite of those things and you meet people with no mercy and no compassion and a judgmental iron fist, it's as if you're doing that to Jesus. We are made in his image. So however you're treating, it's the golden rule, however you're treating someone else is essentially how you're treating Jesus. Love him like they did. Treat them like he did. Provide for them the mercy that he has given to you and then you'll understand it. Yeah. One of my last thoughts, and I'm going to wrap my part of this up, is that I'm just going to preach it until somebody gets a revelation of it. I'm just going to just keep talking about I'll it until somebody it gets it, and I'm praying that it's going to happen. But one of the last things I looked at was in the book of Hebrews where it said, let us come boldly into the throne room of his grace that we may obtain mercy. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to crawl in and you know act like a worm on the ground. The scripture says to us, let us come boldly into the throne room of his grace that we may obtain the first thing, mercy. The first thing that we obtain in the throne room of grace, his grace, is his mercy. Otherwise, we wouldn't be there. No. So. I've, yeah, that's awesome. We, we got to get back to being, to being bold. And, you know, it, like that, people, oh, God, if, if you please. Yeah, I wish you would, too. You've been kind of compromising and pansy lately. <laughs> Holding back. And Screaming, at me, losing my voice. No! No! <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's, it's, I, I'm, I don't know. We need, I mean, you think of, and I won't go long because I know we're, we're already going over, but like uh, John the Baptist, you know, he goes and he tells, um, oh, shoot, uh, how did I just draw a blank on the name? Herodias. Herodias, yeah. How they're living together and how it's wrong. That's bold. You're going to a the head dude in charge, and yeah. you're like, hey, this is wrong. You need to stop. And he ends up losing his head mm -hmm. because of the, the wife. But that's, that's bold. We've got to be bold. I mean, look at Elijah mm -hmm. and saying all the stuff he said to Ahab and Jezebel and calling out the, the, the false prophets and... Where does that fruits? kind of boldness come from? I think boldness comes from, <laughs> from the, Holy Spirit. the truth and knowing that you're right and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But for me, it's always been the, the true knowledge that you are right. Yeah. You can be bold when you, you know that you're standing on the truth, you're standing on what is right. You don't have to, you don't have to be afraid. I want the hoodie the one pastor has instead of confidence, it says Godfidence. Mm -hmm. Because that's where, that's true confidence. Because like that, like, oh yeah, you know, we have the truth and we know we are right, but then you have those people that take that too far on the spectrum and then they're so self-righteous and everyone else is dumb because they have the truth. That's not how it is. Like, yeah, we have the truth and we have the confidence and the boldness, but that doesn't mean we need to treat people like crap right. and that they're beneath us. Like, right. that's not it either. But just having that confidence in God and knowing like, no matter what, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like no matter what, I know God's got me in this. He's either going to bring me out of it 
or I'm going to go see him in heaven, and that's going to be a whole lot better than any other time I've got left on earth. Woo. The last thing I said, one of the last things I said was mercy rewrites every story. Um, somebody who has moved from here to, I think it was Michigan, who had some legal trouble, who went through some troubles and looked like they were going to go to prison for about 15 years. Um, a series of miracles happened, and it was found out that they were not guilty. They didn't do it. And so they, whew, they were set free from looking at 15 years and went to zero. And this person was watching in Michigan, or Wisconsin, I think it was. And they, they, they shared the sermon, and they wrote that quote, Mercy rewrote my story. I'm like, woo. I mean, that is that is literally as funny that you say that because I just heard that almost, well, not that, but a very similar illustration of Jesus. They, the pastor, he was looking at prison time and because he had lived just a terrible life before Anybody that. Local? And he was like, you know, it's literally, you imagine standing in the courtroom, facing all these charges, facing all this prison time, knowing you're about to go. And in the back of the room, the doors bust open and this guy comes in and says, no, I'm going to take his spot and serve his sentence. Mm -hmm. And then you get to walk out free. That's Jesus. Oh, I was like, dang, I was like, you know, imagine how you would well, yeah, feel. Yeah, yeah. Like you're looking at, okay, I'm looking at life in prison. I'm never going to see the outside of a jail cell. And, th and then mm -hmm. someone comes in and they're like, I'm taking his place. Let him go. That's mercy. That's mercy. That's wow. God. That is Jesus, Jesus coming down and dying for our sins, taking the entire sentence on himself. So let the church hear the word of mercy. Uh, and mercy is the word for the day. And I hope that it was something that you guys could take home with you and, and use. And hopefully you used it that day and right on through the week. Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. And it's not stopping coming. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday's coming. No. Um, uh, yeah, that's great. Now, I've got I've got my idea. I think I'll, I'll put it out well, here for only the people. Wednesday. The, yeah, for the people that are. I've gotten past the point of being scared. <laughs> like before, if it wasn't like ready on Wednesday, I'm like, oh man. But now I'm like, okay, God can still speak to me on on Friday and Saturday. Yep. And I'll be okay. So Absolutely. I'm kind of already like, eh, you know. But I think where I wanted to go, as I was telling you, and for the family room, since if you're still here, watching the entire thing. Um, where I wanted to go on Sunday, something, actually the message I wanted to preach the last time before it switched. But as I was studying it, it was just like, I, you can't start here and I'll explain it, you know. But, so I think I'm going to jump back a couple and I think I want to turn it into a little short series, maybe three or four weeks with the chapters leading up to it and culminating in what that chapter is. Um, but basically out of Second Chronicles, I'm not going to tell you what, because that's cheating. But uh, I think I've already got the series title. I think I'm going to call it Back to the Basics. All right. So, good. That'd back be to good. the Basics. I'm looking We're forward to it. Jumping back and laying foundations and, and going back to the basics. So, be with us. It's a growing season now. It's going back to school, September, October, November, December. Those are great months. Come early, if you will. Come to team meetings at 9 20. See what the teams are doing. If you're not a part of a team, get involved in one. Um, they get to hear everything before church starts. We get to let them in on the insight stuff that's going on. Uh, if you haven't joined a team, please do that. And if you're coming just to come to church, if you haven't been in a while, we want to welcome you. Come early, sit up front, and enjoy the service in its entirety. Don't miss anything. Stay and just soak it all in. We live in such a difficult, negative world. It's nice to go to a positive atmosphere, so just come and hang out and soak it in. September is going to be a month where we have a lot of community activity going on in the family here and food and all the kind of cool things we're doing. So Pretty good. don't miss it. Be a part of it. The church yeah. is growing. I, I, probably I'll tell them Sunday all the stuff about the land. But it's all good. Perfect. With that, we'll see you Sunday. You guys have a great rest of the week. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you. And you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.